Hello, everyone, and welcome back to this week's development update and community Q&A session. I'm Adam Bradford, the product director for D&D Beyond. Let's jump in because I want to leave plenty of time for questions today. So for today's lineup, we'll talk about some latest updates, where we are, how the progress is going on all the exciting things that we are working on. Upcoming, I'm going to give a preview of our more high fidelity mock for the encounter builder that uh, we are going to start putting the polish and pretty on top of uh, some of the wireframing that has been done now. So you'll get a peek at that. We do have a data update for a few of the uh, items of question for the artificer. So we'll take a look at which races are being chosen, which infusions are being chosen the most and so on. And then again, plenty of time for questions. Also, by way of announcement, next week we will not have a development update. We're also not going to have a Heroes of the Veil episode. There is a good bit of travel going on and I will be out of town. So we will not have a development update next week. That makes this the last development update of the month. And I typically try to on the last week of the month uh, spend as much time on questions as I can. So that's kind of the, the goal today. And then we will be back the first week of April with the next dev update. So latest updates, pre-alpha encounter builder. We are still working on the goal of getting uh, the encounter and the encounter list together. So that is uh, in progress. Entitlements and authentication. So this is something that is currently in progress now. So we are uh, starting to transition some of our uh, framework into a distributed architecture. And a big part of that is getting entitlements and permissions working correctly. And then the authentication piece of this is where we are going to introduce Google as a sign-in and registration provider. So we have uh, started getting that going and uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes over the next few weeks and we will let everyone know as soon as you're able to start signing in with Google. But that is in progress at this point. It's going to make things much more accessible, particularly for children under the age of 13 uh, to be able to uh, sign in to D&D Beyond using Google. So we're really excited to start getting that in place. The mobile beta character sheet, I am seeing progress on this. Uh, the team is working on it. We are hopeful to share more, uh, even just some uh, pretty pictures and uh, previews with you before too much longer on this. We've been redoing uh, how the header is working in some ways to take better advantage of the native app on the phone. And I'm excited about how that is looking and feeling. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll see if we can provide a preview of that in uh, the next couple of weeks. And then also I wanted to call out, in case you haven't noticed this, when we initially launched D&D Beyond, we covered all of the monsters in an adventure that would end up showing up in the appendix of that adventure. So the typical format is you have adventure text and all the exciting things that are happening in an adventure. And then if you're going to need to refer to a monster, you can go to the stat block in the appendix. Throughout the adventures, you also have called out NPCs that are, uh, you know, potentially variants of existing monster stat blocks. Most of the time, those are from the monster manual because if they're not, they would be printed in the appendix of each adventure as well. And so 
in preparation for the encounter builder and making sure that as we provide official encounters uh, as part of your purchase of all these books, we have to go in and make sure that these adventures have individual monsters ready to go and that those variants are also in place. So our content management team has been working uh, very hard and making some progress on some of the adventures at this point. That is going to be an ongoing process, but you will start to see, I believe, uh, for instance, I think maybe uh, Waterdeep Dragon Heist is uh, completed, maybe Dungeon of the Mad Mage. We're working through those adventures, and you will see that named NPCs that have uh, something that is different about them, you know, the little blocks of text that say, so-and-so is a thug with the following changes. Those are the things that we are creating and will be in place in order to have them ready for the encounter builder. So you're going to start seeing those things being entered and being available over time as well. So upcoming, uh, not much has changed here, but content management is that next major step for our content team. And this is after we get some uh, the entitlements and authentication pieces in place. Uh, entitlements was something that we need in order for content management to work uh, properly. And so that's a prerequisite. We're going to get those things completed. We're going to move into content management as the next major feature that we're looking at. There will be some work in between there on a release, Ghost of Saltmarsh. Uh, so we're uh, eagerly awaiting getting that content and uh, we're gonna have to uh, just, as we always do with all content releases, we're gonna have to take that and drop everything and make sure that that is covered because we anticipate some new rules and everything else in Ghost of Saltmarsh. And so we uh, will have to do that kind of in the middle here. But the next major feature uh, without thinking through that release is content management. We'll move into that. My characters page updates, AL validation. And I have called out here that we do have some new bundle types that are in the final stages of approval uh, that should happen any day now. And so hopefully before too much longer, we're going to introduce some new ways to buy and uh, you know especially group the content in order to purchase that. And so when we have some more concrete details, we will share those. But the legendary bundle is getting pretty big and it is pretty expensive and we are very aware of that. And so we're trying to break some of that content up where it makes a little bit more sense and it gives more options to our uh, fans and customers out there. All right, let's see. What is, ah, oh, let's look at this. All right, let's take a look at our encounter builder. So this is a higher fidelity mock of our encounter builder and what's going to be going on with it. Very exciting stuff. Um, I really love the uh, layout and the look and feel here. Our uh, design team's uh, gone ab above and beyond. Oh, there it is. I did it. Did you see what I did um, with, with everything that's going on here? You can go in with your player characters. You can change the number and the level of any of these characters. You can come in and let's say that you have three characters that are level one, but then you have two characters that are level two. You can add another block like this to be able to account for that. You also can pull directly from one of your campaigns. So the campaign's gonna come in. Um, some of the things you see here, because again, we are trying to get this out into alpha as early as we possibly can. We're essentially looking for minimum lovable product. And so once we get to that threshold, we're gonna put this out. So some of these things might not be there for the very, very first release to our subscribers in alpha, but this is the direction that everything is headed regardless. And so you'll be able to pull in your campaign. You can add characters from there. Uh, you can see the summary of everything that's going on with, you know, number of characters and all this. Um, you see that I can come through here and you will be able to drag and drop uh, monsters here from your list. You can search here to find the monsters that you want. So I'm going to add my Aracokra here and that is going to come over. 
You can see that uh, we could add another instance of the Aracocra here as well. I, I saw, I think that's one of the questions that I saw come through uh, for today, but you can add other groupings of these monsters and you can change the quantity and uh, all of the math is gonna be done for you. And then I guess if we really wanted to kill the party, we can add an Aboleth and you can see that that is going to all of a sudden make this a deadly encounter because the Aboleth is pretty tough. So uh, this is a peek at what is coming with the encounter builder. Uh, we're all very excited about this and we're uh, working very diligently to get this out into the hands of our alpha testers uh, where we can continue to get feedback and we can continue to iterate. And uh, again, really, really excited about this. Once we get there, once you click next from here, it's going to take you to uh, you know the next page here. We will have a page that will allow you to take that encounter and really customize the encounter. So this is things that, uh, again, over time, you'll be able to add uh, descriptions of the encounter. You will be potentially able to add like timelines of an encounter, like, hey, this thing happens here. You'll be able to attach maps to the encounter. Uh, there, there are a variety of things that you're gonna be able to do there. Eventually you'll be able to, to attach treasure uh, parcels and, and that kind of thing to an encounter. And then you will be able to then go through to the encounters, uh, the encounter details page. And that's going to be the thing that if you wanted to share this with someone in the community, they would land on that details page that would show a view of all the monsters that, that are in the encounter, all the customizations and the flavor text that you've maybe added with that encounter. And then of course, the next pretty major step after that is allowing you to run this encounter with initiative tracking and with uh, hit point condition tracking and everything else that's going to happen with uh, monsters and PCs. So that, that's kind of the, the shape of how uh, the trajectory for how things are gonna go here. And this is, uh, again, this, this is looking great. I'm really proud of what the team's done here. Very proud of the things that the developers are doing to make this work. And we're gonna get this into alpha as quickly as we can. We'll keep updating when that comes along. All right, let's see what's next. Looks like we've got, oh, I shouldn't have even expanded. We've got an Artificer data update. So the Artificer, we've got, uh, let's see, I think I can go full screen here, um, full screen. All right, we've got uh, Artificers by race. Why is it fetching my data? All right, Artificers, uh, top 15 races for Artificers. So I'm going to actually come in here and turn off the other real quick because you know it's a pretty large bucket there uh, and it's just a collection of everything else uh, outside the, the top 15. But we turned off the other and then you can see that there are a lot of gnome Artificers out there already. So 27% human being the next highest. Both of those make a great deal of sense to me. Then we've got Warforged is actually there in the third spot. So again, the top three here, Gnome, Human, Warforged. I actually did guess this before we ever even ran the data and I was correct. And then we've got Elf, Dwarf, Changeling, uh, half elf. So you see Eberron represented here pretty strongly, which makes sense. Uh, people are probably trying to create their characters from back in third edition, fourth edition. Uh, Tiefling Genasi the Vidalkin from Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. And then Goblin. I thought Goblin would be a little higher. I was wrong on that one. Uh, but yeah, Goblins are in there. Kobolds, Halfling, Dragonborn, Arakokra. So Gnome in a commanding lead when it comes to what's going on with our artificer. All right, let's see. Uh, and then subclass choices so far with the artificer. We see that we have alchemist and artillerist, and we see that the alchemist 
uh, is not being chosen quite as much as the artillerist. And we will, of course, expand this information. Uh, we've gotten hints that some other subclasses are coming in additional uh, Unearthed Arcana releases in the, in the coming months. So we'll keep, you know, kind of put those in here and see what we can to do to normalize the data to see how many people are choosing any of these new ones that might come out. But right now, Artillerist is being chosen slightly more than the Alchemist. And then finally, our item infusions. So you can see that enhanced defense so far is being chosen the most, as is enhanced weapon. So that makes a lot of sense. And it also, uh, I believe those are available pretty early on in the Artificer's career. And then uh, you have the uh, Replicate Magic Item Bag of Holding. So bags of holding are very important. <laughs> and again, available at lower levels. Returning Weapons, Boots of the Winding Path, Mini Handed Pouch. So a lot of the Artificer-specific types of items here, the Returning Weapon, the Boots of the Winding Path, uh, have been popularly chosen at this point in time. And uh, you see that as some of the uh, infusions, of course, again, this is pretty early here. Some of the infusions are available later in the Artificer's career. They're not quite as uh, you know prominent yet. We have the Alchemy Jug. I don't know why anyone would want this Alchemy Jug because it makes mayonnaise and it doesn't make sweet tea. So I have homebrew versions of this item that correct that grave error in judgment to include mayonnaise instead of sweet tea. I don't understand who would do that. I've talked to Jeremy about it. It's such a terrible idea. All right, let's see. How do I get out of here? There we go. All right. So back here, I think it is time for questions. So we'll go to our questions now. I've got some that have been collected over the last several weeks that I have not been able to get to in the stream. So I'm going to start with some of those. Let's see. So Trevor Adams, for the Encounter Builder, would it be possible to create stacks or groups of enemies if they are all the same type? This was a question that I happened to see. Uh, so yeah, as you can see a little earlier with the mock preview, we do have the ability, we will have the ability uh, to have you know, different instances of groups of the same creature. Uh, being able to manage multiple enemies' hit points without seeing their redundant information Cluttering the screen would be neat. So again, once we get to the running, the encounter part, I think you'll understand how that's going to work. There are many dungeon masters that I have seen over the years, and this is something that we are going to try to implement, where you have a group of, let's say, 10 kobolds. I believe a kobold has four or five hit points, so let's just say five hit points. And we could say that that pool of 10 kobolds have 50 hit points. And you can just keep track of the pool or the group, uh, you know, at 50 hit points. And that basically as you're narrating, you're just narrating some of them falling occasionally, depending on how much, you know, damage is uh, being done. But it can give it that real sense that there still is a horde and a, um, you know, a, a grouping of these monsters that are harassing characters. And it still is going to... Uh, you know, work out the math appropriately. So that is an option that we are likely to include at least over time as well. And what are some of the unexpected challenges you've faced thus far when designing the encounter builder? To be honest, many of the uh, challenges are not, we do not typically face challenges that are too complex for us to solve. Our greatest challenge is the sheer number of the things that we're trying to cover. So it really is just a matter of scope and scale and not the individual complexity of anything we're pulling off. At the end of the day, most everything in D&D comes down to math. Now, sometimes that math is a little complicated, but we do not have a lot of challenges 
in implementing the math behind the things. We don't have a lot of problems that we can't solve. It's just we have a lot of opportunities and problems out there that we are trying to solve. And so when it comes to the encounter builder, in order for us to make sure that we are all still enjoying everything that's going to happen with that encounter builder five, ten years from now, um, again, this this Dungeons and Dragons thing might stick around a while. I don't know if any of you guys know that, but uh, this D and D thing is 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 kind of you know a big deal these days. So we want to make sure that D and D Beyond is providing the best service that we possibly can over the long term. And so one of the challenges with the Encounter Builder has been we haven't been able to just make an Encounter Builder because that would have you know cut off our nose to spite the face. And it would have been a short-term solution to something that needs to stand the test of time. And so we have taken an approach, again, uh, a lot of technical things that have had to be done behind the scenes that probably are not terribly exciting to the community are very, very vital. They're very important things. It's the way that these things are going to have the quality and the reliability and everything else that our customers are going to expect. And so we're taking those steps. And so really the biggest challenge has probably been that we haven't been just making an encounter builder. We are really addressing platform and making sure that we are set up to stand the test of time. Rasmus Bakeguard, maybe is how you say that. Can the DM get an overview of the campaign player's stats in one window? Just a table would cut it and a link to their individual character sheet, just the six core abilities and perhaps passive perception. So um, our DM screen is going to do something um, like that. Um, I do think uh, we're always opening in Photoshop. I forget about that. Um, so we are going to, um, you know, at some point it's going to look bad when I zoom in here, um, but at some point we are going to get to where you are seeing, and, and these are not final disclaimer all over this, you know, like whatever I have to do here, not final. No. Um, so this is not final, but we are going to end up having this type of information available. This would likely make its way into any kind of combat tracking, anything that you'd uh, be looking for. So I imagine that that is going to check the box that you're bringing up there uh, pretty, pretty strongly. Dave Clark, is it possible to get a PC bundle of D and D beyond assets PC bundle? So I believe you might be talking about our new bundle types that are coming there. Uh, PC, uh, the distinctions are far more likely to be source book versus adventure. So part of that, you know, one of those definitely leans more, uh, toward a PC, but the way that Wizards of the Coast categorizes their books, we're following suit by the way that they do that. And we'll have more information on that as soon as I'm able to share it. Dust Fingers Double Zero. What part of the roadmap slash what feature does the ability to store interchangeable spells in an item fall under? Example, Ring of Spell Storing, Stone of Reserve. So a really important thing for me to share is that our roadmap that you see, the public feature roadmap, is not an exhaustive list. There are several smaller features or systems that are on our list that we're working internally that will be interspersed over time um, alongside some of these more major features. This ability to add spells to items is something that we really want. It's something that we want for uh, the artists, uh, artificers introduction. It's something that we want for scrolls. It's something uh, that we do want to get in place. It's not on the roadmap uh, that we're sharing publicly, but it is on our internal roadmap. And I would say that that one's in a you know short to midterm place on that roadmap. So we're gonna be trying to squeeze that in as soon as we are able to do so. Let's see. Sam of Wise, is homebrewing full subclasses a part of the homebrew revamp? 
ticket on the roadmap Trello. We, it, it's too early to say exactly how that's going to work, but I can say that our intent is that we would take a look at a lot of the gaps that we have out there for homebrew when it comes to that homebrew revamp. Part of the danger in this, and we saw this happen with the character sheet revamp, one of the words that uh, reasons that we don't really even like that word revamp at this point is that when we start, when I start answering questions like, yes, uh, homebrew base classes are going to be a part of that revamp, the moment that we release a piece of that revamp as an iteration, because again, that's how we want to operate. We want to deliver value early and often. We're about to like work a little bit in the holding pattern on some of those things because a lot of these iterations that are that are happening are happening behind the scenes and you can't see the results yet. But um, but as we get encounter builder uh, content management, some of these things in place, you're going to start to see that those iterations are going to happen quicker and quicker because we realize that that is just the best way to work and the best way to make sure that we're delivering what the community needs. And so the dangers of me saying that, yes, homebrew based classes are going to be part of the homebrew revamp is that if we release some new UI for the homebrew revamp and we don't have base classes, there's confusion, there's disappointment, there's, uh, you know, mismanaged expectations that you said this was part of the revamp. And I can say all day, well, the revamp's still going on. We're not done with the revamp, but that messaging always, does, you know, uh, loses uh, something and it has diminishing returns. So uh, ultimately what I can say is that we have the intent for this to be focused on during that time that we're focusing on the rest of homebrew. I hope that makes sense. Uh, DMW71, can you share anything, all caps, he's yelling at me, um, about the progress of content management feature? It was supposed to be next after Mega Menus, but it seems to have been passed by additional content providers and the Artificer playtest material. Any glimmer of hope about this feature would be greatly appreciated. Um, he definitely wants to make sure that uh, he, he has content management. So with content management, as I shared a little bit earlier, we need some architecture in place with entitlements and authentication before we can be effective at delivering the content management. So there's been conceptualization. There's even been a little bit of work on content management, but this other work that we're doing technically is considered part of content management because there are prerequisites for content management. So that is how that works for us. As we are working in an agile environment, we're going to say that, hey, we want to do content management. And that is a priority. So it hasn't uh, really slipped in priority. We want to do content management. But then as we get closer and closer to it and we discover more and more about what's needed for content management, sometimes other things as we start to refine the backlog, you're going to see that other things are going to appear to slip in but they're not really slipping in. They're just things that are needed in order for that other thing to be done. So that is the case with content management. And uh, you can also see uh, another part of this is we did have the Artificer Unearthed Arcana come out, and that was a disruptive event. So as soon as that came out, we all hands on deck and, and we had to do something to make it be available to the community. That became a priority. So yes, that what, and, and that's a call I'll still make tomorrow. Um, and it's also a call that I'll make when Ghost of Saltmarsh content and material, you know, when the final version of that comes to us, we will more or less drop everything to make sure that we are covering those commitments to have those things out, you know, in the Artificer's case, as soon as possible, or in the case of Ghost of Saltmarsh, as soon as that book is released. So those are the commitments that are very important to us and those will end up taking priority. And that's that's the case uh, with the Artificer. Captain Mugen, will the critical role content be added to the mega menus? Finding the gunslinger is really difficult these days. So um, we are we have already added the Blood Hunter to the classes section on the mega menu. So you can see that there. And then I do believe that we are going to do some work to get the gunslinger 
integrated into the fighter class page. Some of the concerns with that is at the end of the day, it's not official content. I love what, what Matt's making, but it's not official content. And as an official tool set, we have to make sure that we're doing a good job of segregating that from the official content in order to avoid confusion, particularly with newer players. So that is what we need to make sure that we check that box and we are going to try to get the Gunslinger uh, integrated into the fighter page. Keeping that in mind, let's see, not half wing. Will the Blood Hunter be available in the mobile app at any point? Yes, it will be. No ETA. Stack of Cups. What changed in scope of D&D Beyond to want to make a virtual tabletop in the future? What changed in scope? So I think this is uh, referring to... Uh, so, so D and D Beyond launched. Uh, we had our first full year, uh, you know, la last year. So we're now in our first, you know, or our second full year. And as we're starting to look at that, I can say that again, in an agile environment, and even from a vision perspective, we have had no idea if this thing was going to to take off or anything else. I mean, there's a risk involved in any kind of business. I'm happy to say that uh, we're doing well and, and things are, are, are really great and we are investing and we are doing much, much more with D&D with &D Beyond. And again, you guys aren't even seeing all the full effects of that yet because it's been very recently that we've scaled up the team. I think we have 20, 26 people on the D&D Beyond team at this point in time. And so that is up from about seven for that, you know, first year or so that we had. So the team is growing. The team is scaling. Uh, we are trying to get all of our ducks in a row to really start firing on all cylinders. We're going to continue that investment. We have a lot of exciting things in store as we start looking at how the tool set is going to evolve. It just became a natural next step to go into some type uh, of virtual. And, and again, I've said that we're not even calling it a virtual tabletop. We're doing something virtual. Um, and, uh, and, and so that is going to be an exciting thing. And I do believe that as we continue to go down the path, it's going to become very apparent why it is a natural extension. But a lot of that we can't quite talk about yet because it is far in the future, but it is something that, uh, at the end of the day, just makes sense where we find ourselves at this point a couple of years in. 19 Gaming, uh, your party inventory, will there be one soon? Depends on your definition of soon, but there will be one. Militron 81, do we have a feature request in the product backlog to assemble a party in DDB and have it track buffs from other party members? This is what we have called temporary effects as a system and it is something that we will do and it's something that i really really hope to see um not even going to tell you a time frame yet but we, we we want this one to happen uh deadly ambitions are you guys going to allow dms to limit races and classes in campaigns that will be an iteration of content management at some point in the future initially content management will only whitelist or blacklist sources, but we will get down into individual elements uh, at some point. Let's see, Militron 81. Can we bring the Sage Advice rules clarification stuff over? This is uh, something that's been on my list for quite some time, and I imagine we will see this at some point. I would like to see this where when you're reading rules text, it displays some type of notification that there is some sage advice uh you know rules clarification that is available for that passage of text and you're able to see what that clarification is mouse over tool tip click into sidebar whatever the implementation is of that but yes it is something that i would like to see and it is on the list scott's clan with the release of ghost of salt marsh Will you make character sheets for ships and a way to link them to characters? It's a very good question. So yes, we will have 
and we will cover vehicles. Now, I can very much so say that we do not have Ghost of Saltmarsh final content yet. So uh, again, this is just the release cycle. This is the production cycle for any of these books. As soon as we get our hands on that, we are going to have to assess what's going on with vehicles. And so the answer is yes, we have every intent to provide a section and a way for you to access and utilize your vehicle with your character. But we are going to have to see that, you know, we don't end up in some kind of crazy development scope and they've changed everything from the UA. You know, I, I, that is all unlikely to happen. But I do have to put that out there as a disclaimer that we are going to handle as much as we possibly can. And I can tell you that the intent is to cover it and the intent is to cover it before the release date for Ghost of Saltmarsh. But we will have to see what we're biting off when that is finalized. I need to scroll up on the questions here where I can just look into the same place each time. That would be a much better process, process improvement. All right, Crack Jack Flood. I have a suggestion for homebrew items. If possible, can we have the option to have multiple different charges for different spells so that they don't share the same charges pool? Currently, if you have two spells on an item, they both expend the same pool of charges. Thank you in advance. Boy, that sounds hard. No, um, it's uh, it's it, it's it's not. Again, it's not too tough, but it's uh, it really is just a matter of prioritization. So we're going to try our best to cover examples that we see in official items and something like this. Uh, I you know I think it could have some value. But I can tell you it wouldn't be prioritized, uh, you know, at, at this point in time. V2 Blast, if you had an unlimited budget and freedom, what feature would you add to D&D Beyond? Uh, the features that we're going to be adding. I'm not saying we have an unlimited budget, but I am telling you that we are investing heavily. So um, we, we are pursuing the dream. Uh, and what I believe will be, what I believe will change change the game. Um, and so we are pursuing all of those things. And so there, there's really nothing that we're not already pursuing that any additional budget uh, would would make me change my mind about. Um, AK three one eight. I noticed accessibility updates has been moved to in progress. Any word? What types of accessibility features are being worked on first? It's a very good question. Uh, with accessibility, this is certainly a marathon and not a sprint. It's, it's not something that we are going to be able to make everything better immediately. I wish that I could snap my fingers and make that happen. But what we are specifically working on in the short term is we've received feedback that some screen readers, uh, we've been working with the DOTS RPG group they are wonderful um, to work with, very happy for their support and uh, for partnering with us and helping us test things. But we've received feedback that screen readers find difficulty consuming compendium content, i.e. the book content. We also got stories that really did not strike me before we started hearing this, that D&D Beyond is one of the first ways that people uh, with accessibility issues have been able to even consume fifth edition content because in a book form without braille versions of these books yet, it, it was just not something that could even happen. So having it in this digital format, people are able to consume the content for the first time on D&D Beyond, which is incredible. And I'm, I'm so glad that we can do that. But we're also discovering that the way that some of our HTML is structured, primarily, I don't want to get too into the weeds here, but primarily because of the way that we have to convert the content from InDesign files over into HTML to be able to use in the website. There are artifacts and things that do not affect web display in any way, but they do affect screen readers. And so discovering that, we have started working on ways to clean up that compendium content 
where hopefully a screen reader can consume that content without it doing things like reading, uh, you know, it, <laughs> one of the, the really bad ones would, would be, you know, it would, it would come in and it would say, um, it would get to something on a class page and it would say, Cluh, and it would pause and then ass features uh, because it has like some ghost artifact in, in the middle of the word class. So we're working initially on trying to clean that content up in order for the books themselves to be consumed in an easier and a better way. So that's, that's the first pass. It's a little bit of a lengthy pass, but it's something that's important because it will feed all the rest of the accessibility updates and changes that we will do throughout the rest of uh, this year and beyond that. DTW0917, does the inclusion of the UA Artificer on D&D Beyond give any more insight on adding homebrew classes to the system? No, it, I, it technically doesn't. Like a class is a class is a class for us at this point. Homebrew, the offering of homebrew classes to the public has little to nothing to do with us needing to, you know, particularly learn anything from any of the existing classes. It has everything to do with trying to package that in a way where people understand that it will have limitations no matter what we do. We will never be able to develop the crazy resource type that you have in mind out there for your custom class. So that is the reason that we've been hesitant to introduce them in the past. We have seen that people are telling us that they don't care about that. I hypothesize some people are going to care about that and we are gonna have some headaches after we do this. But again, we want to deliver what the, um, you know, what the, the community is wanting. So uh, definitely going to get into it at some point, but the difficulty doesn't really lie in trying to cover anything that the official classes are doing. It's more in trying to cover the unknown, the things that we will have no idea how to actually do. Let's see. Uh, CN Lord 77 once homebrew base classes are released, will we be able to publish old UA that didn't make it to D&D Beyond? Um, you will not be able to publish official content or share that with the community. You will be able to create whatever you would like to use privately. And that, that's been our guideline from the beginning. Uh, Supercron 3, could we get a homebrew spotlight article once a month to show off a few homebrew things and get more eyes on the homebrew part of D&D Beyond? So this would be a little bit similar to inviting all your friends over to look at your little junker car. Now, I'm, I'm being a little mean to our homebrew system. Um, we're not going to place a ton of emphasis on trying to really pull people into our homebrew system until we're a little prouder of how that homebrew system works. So again, we hope to get to that later this year, but uh, and, and we'll see how that goes. Once we get to that step, I imagine we are going to want to pull out the red carpet and invite everyone we possibly can to understand it and to see its uh, you know, output from the community and everything else. It is something that's on our minds, something we want to do, but we're not quite ready uh, to, to do that because the system itself, as I've said, shared in the past, it's basically how we enter data. And so we just tried to put a little bit of a pretty uh, form UI on top of it, but it is not where we want it to be. And we want to make some changes and improvements to that later this year. Uh, oh, Kurashi, sorry about that one. Uh, there are so many rich images across the various adventures, maps, cities, dungeons, etc. Can we get the same rich searching for images so it's easier to take them for homebrew campaigns? We do plan to do something with images in the future that will hopefully make what you're talking about a reality. Uh, let's see. Okay, just a couple more of these, and then we'll take some from chat. Kilmernock1285, favorite barbecue, beef, chicken, or pork? Beef, hands down, although pork is pretty good too. 
Barbecue chicken, the way it comes at most of these restaurants, not a fan of. I'm a pretty big fan of barbecue chicken that I make myself on my own grill. Uh, GK Smith LCW. Why can't we access the map pack via a compendium link? Because the map pack itself is just a series of images, and that's how it's delivered to us digitally, and that's how we've chosen to deliver that to the community. If we can understand, uh, if you have feedback about how that would be, uh, you know, better as somehow a compendium link, we'd love to hear it, and and we'll consider that. Uh, Emma Van Bachhoven, is it possible to create elder homebrew eldritch invocations on D and D Beyond? No, it is not. But the Warlock Legion out in the world there has beat on the drums, and we know that it is something that we need to make happen at least at some point. All right, let's see what other kind of questions we have from chat. I think that is a Legion with a zero. Um, is the Encounter Builder available to all subscription levels? So I think specifically you're talking about alpha, and the answer is yes, any type of subscription will secure you a spot in the alpha test for the encounter builder. Kit Kat Cosplay, will adventure encounters be pre-built so we can just click and go? Yes, all official adventures will have pre-built encounters. I think that our content management team is really looking forward to using the encounter builder to go in and build those adventures for everyone. Uh, eBlock5555, can we distribute XP through the calculator too? Um, that is a very good question. It's not something that's going to happen right away, but it is something that we are going to want to add over time. Uh, I, I, I do really like that one, and I imagine it will happen. Light Guard JP. Maybe this is too early, but will encounters be saved somewhere? I can get to them all the time and build up ahead of time. Yes. So it's not too early for that. To give you a little bit of insight, where we currently are with alpha readiness is we are trying to get to a point where you have the first page of the encounter builder, which I showed off a little bit of today. And then you get to kind of the next page, which we're not going to immediately do in the alpha, but that's the customization page. So then kind of the third page you know, uh, is where we're going to skip to, which is the details of the encounter. And once we have the details of the encounter there, there will also be a My Encounters section that you will be able to go to, and that will be under the Creations menu. So you can go to My Encounters. You will see a listing of all the encounters that you have added or create initially in the alpha, the encounters that you've created, and then you will be able to access those, go to their detail pages, and so on. So yes, that is the scope of the first release into alpha. That's when you guys, when we get to that point is when we will hit the button. All right, let's see. Bad, bad with two A's, 007. I can't see it now, but is it safe to assume you'll be able to build NPCs like characters and add them to the encounter? and see what the difficulty is. Initially, you will only be able to add monsters, but yes, over time, you'll be able to do it. So I believe you're saying that it would be using character classes. That's not gonna be available initially, but you will be able to do that at some point. Entropy Moo, will I be able to make custom monsters and NPCs using the character builder? So not using the character builder, no but on the heels of the encounter builder. And when we get it to a good solid spot, we will be developing our monster builder. And I've talked about this in the past, but essentially that is going to be something where you can pull in an existing monster or you can start from scratch. You can start entering ability scores, special abilities. You'll be able to drag and drop abilities from existing monsters onto your new monster and it will calculate the challenge rating for you. You'll also be able to with a an existing monster like a mind flare 
I think the challenge is 12 there. If you want a weaker or stronger Mind Flayer, you'll be able to slide the uh, challenge slider and go lower or higher, and all the math will update and cascade down through that. So the hope there is that we get rid of the need to reskin creatures at that point in time. But uh, no, it will not be in the character builder. It will be a, a separate tool that will be doing that. Mark Newt, or Nut maybe, um, is the encounter builder using the math from the Dungeon Master's Guide for encounter building? Or is it based off the encounter balancing outline in Xanathar's? True story here. The math in the Dungeon Master's Guide and the encounter balancing outline in Xanathar's are two different front ends for the same back end. So theoretically, you should get almost identical results with either approach. Um, that is what Wizards of the Coast has stated there. To answer your question, though, it is not based on either of those. It is based on the secret sauce math that Wizards of the Coast uses themselves to create and balance these monsters. The, uh, the truth is uh, we've seen this math, and it is not something that would be conducive to publishing in a Dungeon Master's Guide because it will be just too complicated for typical players to be able to use and for even the uh, you know designers to be able to make uh, make it make sense to people, so the math is very complicated. We will be using that, and we will be demystifying that math into a user interface that you can easily use that math without it being complicated and difficult. Uh, Leo J seventy seven. Uh, you mentioned the Encounter Builder will track initiative. Will there be a player view of this initiative? So this is where I've got to be a little bit careful. It's maybe not necessarily the Encounter Builder that is doing this, at least in the end. This may be a separate initiative combat tracker. Uh, initially, it would be a little more geared toward a Dungeon Master doing that. In the future, Absolutely, players will see initiative. It will be something that will be tracked. We will have it available as a sidebar item on the character sheet. All of that is where we're headed. Drop Bear ate my baby. Uh, initiative tracker. Will it be able to be randomized every round for chaos initiative? Yes, uh, that is something that we will be putting into place. So the advantages of uh, you know ha tracking initiative digital digitally are going to be really, really huge because first of all, yes, you'll be able to roll dice and, and have it just order your players based on their initiative modifiers and the monster's initiative modifiers and all of those things very easily if you choose to do so. If, and again, this is in the future, uh, this is past encounter builder being, being in a good place, but if players prefer to roll dice, they will be able to roll dice and input their initiative total and it would still order them. So, so yes, if you want to roll initiative every single round, this should be a, a pretty easy way to do that. Uh, Entropy Moo, will there ever be a way for us to make small customizations in monsters without making a whole homebrew? For example, you have three goblins, one has a short sword, one has a club and one has a spear. Yes, there will be a way by the time we get to Monster Builder. That is certainly the idea. The Monster Builder will also allow you to equip items to creatures. And if those items are uh, very powerful, then they are going to impact the challenge rating also. Uh, Sir Digme Chicken Caesar 13. Are there plans to at least add Guild Adept DMs Guild products to DDB? I understand adding everything would be ridiculous. Thank you for recognizing how ridiculous that would be. But I think we have a Guild Adepts. Um, pretty sure we have our first Guild Adepts product that is coming soon. I'm not quite, I, we can't quite announce that yet. But yes, there, there will be some Guild Adept products that are added over time. Uh, in bomb games, are we going to be able to homebrew mundane gear at some point? 
as in I want to make nunchucks or a frying pan weapon, etc. Oh man, we could do, you know, nunchucks could be a club. Like that's what the player's handbook tells you. Um, a frying pan is an improvised weapon that could be kind of like a club too. Basically all improvised weapons end up as like clubs or great clubs, right? Um, but, um, but anyway, if you're not wanting to reskin these things and you're wanting to give these things different statistical values, this is another one of those situations where we have not wanted to do this for some time because it introduces a lot of variables that make us account for those variables in a variety of places that makes things much harder on us. But we do see that there is some level of demand for uh, being able to create this mundane gear. In the meantime, I do encourage you to use the customize feature and you should be able to approximize, um, you know, what uh, approximate what you want approximate and customize together, approximize. Um, V2 Blast, will it be possible, for example, to build an encounter and then share a link to it, i.e. not just save it for yourself? Not initially, but you will be able to definitely share encounters in the future, and you will be able to browse other people's encounters just like you can on a homebrew, add those encounters to your collection, to your list, and so on. Alt F4 will help. Most of the time it doesn't. Uh, are there plans to incorporate the re recently released Eberron content, more grave miscellany and D&D &D beyond? I don't know yet. We'll see what happens. Um, Valak was taken. Any possibility that we get translations of source books or the ability to change to metric units? Probably not getting the metric units thing because we're going to follow the course that Wizards of the Coast has set for how measurements happen. But yes, we do hope eventually to crack the code of how we can provide those translations. It is something that is very much so on our mind. The Howell family, will the links to encounters be permanent links so that they can be used by DM Guild adventure authors? What a clever use for that. And the answer is yes. And it's something that we will strongly encourage in the future. We hope to encourage um, even easier sharing like that on the DMs Guild, but no, no details on that yet. Um, let's see. The G Moat. Greatest something of all time. I don't know what that would be. Um, greatest master of all time. Greatest man of all time. I don't know. Um, greatest mother of all time. I don't know. Um, Encounter Builder, Monster Builder is City Builder after all of that because that would be useful to people who are homebrewing a game, I think. I use Everon, so not for me. How cool would that be, though? It is pretty cool. We'll, uh, we'll see what happens there. Um, my name is Yin. Will there ever be an upgrade for tiers to allow more campaigns to share content? I run a lot of one-shots lately and need to share my content with like three campaigns and two one shots currently, and I'm constantly switching. So the plan is to at least eventually allow for the campaign content sharing limit to be based on players and not characters. So when we get to that point, it's probably going to help, uh, help you out. Uh, Grand Pyromania question. What's your favorite MCU movie? That would be Thor Ragnarok followed uh, pretty closely by Guardians of the Galaxy, the first one, and then probably uh, Winter Soldier. So uh, it's really hard. It's like picking, uh, you know, my favorite kid a little bit uh, when it comes to that. But uh, those definitely are at the top for me. Infinity War did a great job with what it was given, and I cannot wait for Endgame. All right, let's give away a legendary bundle not going to see you next week, so it'll be a couple of weeks. Let's give out a legendary bundle. We've got to know that you exist by you typing something in chat. So type, type, type. Let's see, let's see, let's see um, what's going on. It looks like people are typing, so I think I've delayed long enough. We are going to give out a legendary bundle in five, four, three, two, one. Grim 444. Grim 444, you have won a legendary bundle 
Congratulations. Someone will get with you after the show to award that bundle to you. Congratulations, Grim444. And thanks to everyone for watching today. Really appreciate you spending some time with me. I appreciate the questions, and uh, I'm glad I could catch up some of the previous questions from previous weeks as well this week. Keep all those coming at all times. If something didn't get answered today, feel free to hit me up on Twitter at Bad I Adam. I am most of the time very happy to answer virtually anything. I think you guys probably know that at this point. I hope everybody has a wonderful week. We will not see you for a dev update next week, but then we will see you the week after that. Have a good one. Later, Gators.